a jacket at the front. Uh, and two, we had a small technical glitch uh, with my ability to see the slides and seamlessly look at you at the same time. So I will apologize for having to occasionally look over my shoulder as we present. So other than that, we'll wait and see. Come on in. I was told I have to stay on the side of the stage or I become a, I can become a ghost in the slides. There's a lot to work on. I need to like keep this red dot right here. All right, I think uh, we'll get started because it uh, looks like there might be one or two more people trickling in and uh, they'll close the door in the meantime. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the summit. My name is Mark Relf. I head up global business development for IoT, mobile, and serverless computing at AWS. I'm based... Uh, in Seattle. Uh, I'm formerly from Toronto, so I should remember how hot and humid it is here on the East Coast, but I don't because living in the Pacific Northwest has softened me to the humidity, so I'm glad to be here uh, in Washington to, rem to, uh, to remind me. But uh, we'll have a nice, cool 45 minutes talking about uh, IoT. And this morning I wanted to touch on uh, some of our overall strategy around IoT a few observations uh, that we've seen as people are building systems for the Internet of Things, some observations, want to pass along to you some advice, uh, talk a little bit about some of the partnerships we've made in this space and how we're solving uh, customer problems through solutions, uh, talk about some of our hardware alliances and a few other fun things uh, along the way. And my goal is in a way to be a precursor to the other sessions that we have throughout the day on IoT uh, here at the summit, uh, where we'll dive into a little bit more technical depth in a couple of the other sessions. I, I know we had one session yesterday already. Uh, so hopefully you're able to leave the summit with a relatively well-rounded understanding of all the things uh, related to IoT uh, going forward. So no presentation like this uh, is complete without uh, some very deep uh, analysis into the IoT market. None of which I will do for you this morning because I think we've all read enough uh, analyst reports and news reports and blogs and websites. I think we can all agree that they kind of all net out in the end to um, there's quite a few things connected now. There's probably a lot more things connected in the near future. And soon after that, lots and lots of things will be connected. Uh, there's a few trends driving this. I think for any of us uh, who've been around the industry long enough, the concept of connecting one thing to another thing uh, for a variety of data and analytics, uh, data collection, command and control reasons, not necessarily a new topic. So what's, what's changed? Well, I think it's the commoditization of a number of uh, elements of technology, the cloud driving a big portion of that, but also uh, cheaper hardware, easier protocols, uh, ease of implementation that has actually brought the concept of the Internet of Things to a lot more organizations than traditionally uh, would have considered building these kinds of systems. I, I do a lot of briefings in Seattle for our customers as they come through Seattle to talk to us. And there's sort of two kinds of organizations. I think there's organizations who have been connecting devices for a long time. They have a lot of existing, uh, often cumbersome ways of connecting uh, those systems, expensive, uh, proprietary ways of connecting systems. And while they don't need help understanding why you would want to connect a device, they want to talk about more modern ways of communicating with devices, ingesting data and events, and doing something with that data. Because at the end of the day, IoT, for all the press about home automation and wearables and all these sorts of things. IoT is an interesting term that at the same time means everything and, and, and nothing all at once. Uh, really what it is about is the data for more, most organizations. Yes, 
I think there's this pillar of IoT, which is about turning your lights on and off at home, which is a very important consumer market. Amazon's spending a lot of time in that market ourselves. But for most enterprises, public sector organizations, uh, and, and, and such, it really is about the back-end systems, the analytics that, uh, that you can do. And so there's a type of organization that's been connecting devices for a long time, and then there's this type of organization that because that barrier of entry has dropped, they understand the potential of uh, using that data, and now they are uh, looking at, hey, we, we're gonna be able to connect devices and systems in ways we never could before, and they look for some guidance along that way. You know, for, I think in the public sector in particular, you know, we talk a lot about um, the, the potential of, of IoT and the concept of, you know, smart cities as an example, where you get to the point where every building, every vehicle, um, various uh, services, the residents themselves become a network of sensors and learning systems. So there's this ultimate kind of potential of that becoming not just uh, a point-to-point -point kind of relationship, but a, really a network, a learning network of systems that you're able to use that data in exciting ways. I, I, I was recently in Austin talking to uh, the Congress of U.S. Mayors, and I, I, I pointed this out. I'm Canadian uh, from Toronto, as I mentioned, and uh, you know the smart city maybe has been around for a long time. This is the smart city circa 1931, so this is... Uh, um, uh, an office tower in Toronto, and uh, what that is is a uh, weather uh, uh, station on top of the tower, and it was a very simple system. If the lights went up, it was getting warmer. If the lights went down, it was getting colder. If it blinked white, it was going to snow. If it blinked red, it was going to uh, rain. If it was nice, uh, solid blue, it meant blue sky. And all of the residents, you could just look up, and you'd understand what the weather was instantly. No smartphone, uh, no web browser, uh, no connected device of any kind. Instant connected city in a way. We've probably come a little bit farther than that in, uh, in modern times. And, and like I mentioned, because of the power of the data you're collecting, you know, IoT really becomes this spark for hundreds of new types of applications that are available to organizations. So things like predictive maintenance and logistics applications, um, more advanced resource allocation, uh, a different approach to budgeting, emergency preparedness, uh, customer support, uh, demand estimation, uh, traffic, and the list goes on and on. And all of these things really do have in common the fact that you've been able to collect data from a wide variety of systems and analyze that data and build interesting back-end systems with it. But you know, um, I'd say AWS is in a unique position uh, when it comes to the Internet of Things, uh, I, I think compared to a lot of players in the market. And there's two reasons for that. One, uh, long before perhaps IoT was a, a sort of popular label uh, in the press, and, and long before we actually had the word IoT on a service in the console, um, our customers have been building IoT solutions on top of AWS uh, for, for years. Um, a lot of that they were putting together themselves, the plumbing necessary to build those applications, and I'll talk about that in a second because it represents some of the heavy lifting that those customers discovered in building these systems and why we brought out a few new services I'll talk about. But the other thing that makes us unique um, is we have this playground, uh, this sandbox, a test bed for IoT called uh, Amazon.com uh, in addition to those customers. So you take a ton of really great both business to consumer and enterprise examples of customers have been doing this for a long time, along with our own expertise, the ability for us to walk across the hall and ask some of the people that run some of the most advanced logistics in the world whether or not they would even, if they were a customer, would you buy any of the, the solutions that we're putting together? And they're able to give us a lot of advice. And so when you take uh, that traditional AWS way of starting with the customer first, but then also using ourselves as a customer. It gives us some unique insight into what a lot of people face as they think about building IoT solutions. And I wanted just to share a few of those thoughts with you, because um, we do think it's important as people think about building these systems. So first, um, you'll note the name of the, you know, this tagline is important, that it's the Internet of Things and not the Internet of thing, it is plural. And so why is that important? I think what you see, particularly in the consumer realm with IoT, uh, and you're, so we're at this growing nascent stage of IoT, 
is a lot of po actual point-to-point -point commun uh, communication, a lot of point-to-point -point application. So I have an app on my phone, it turns on the lights. I have a different app on my phone that opens the door. I have a different app on my phone that controls the music. So yes, all of those things are connected. They don't really communicate with one another. Uh, they, it's, that's really the internet of thing, not the internet of things. And so an example would be, uh, and I'll give you a few Amazon examples just to try and reinforce a point, is the work we do in our fulfillment centers as an example. So if you've never seen this, how many people have ordered something from Amazon.com, had a box arrived? Thank you uh, very much. Um, well, when you order something, most likely, not universally, but most likely it comes from one of our new modern fulfillment centers that are powered by these Kiva robots, the orange robots at the bottom. And what's interesting is uh, what happens now is the people don't go to the shelves, the shelves come to the people. And that is, uh, takes less toll on the folks that work in our fulfillment centers and allows you to do much more advanced uh, routing uh, for the people uh, picking and packing the boxes than to be shipped. Human beings are great at packing the boxes still, um, but understanding that the thing I wanted to buy um, is on uh, you know, one of these shelves, what happens is the robot goes underneath, lifts the shelf up an inch, and then zooms the, it over to the person. Uh, this has actually gotten so advanced that we don't even keep the lights on in big parts of the fulfillment center. So you have sort of an energy conservation element as well, because nobody's walking around, it's robots, they don't care if the lights are on or off. And so you're able to dim the lights and save a lot of power in the fulfillment centers, just as a fun aside. So why is this important? Well, we have thousands of these robots. Uh, we have sensors on all of those shelves. We have sensors on the conveyor belts that get things to those shelves. We have sensors on the boxes that get packed from the people. These are complex interrelated systems that if we just had one app controlling the robot and one app controlling the shelf, this would not be possible. You have to be able to expose data in streams that are consumable by multiple systems. That's sort of key learning number one. A second thing we've discovered is that once you enable connectivity to a thing, that thing rarely stays static. And by that I mean um, you may have created a device, you might be in the, in the consumer space, created, created a device, given it connectivity, um, but even in the enterprise space, you, you may have enabled connectivity uh, to systems and then discover that over time, those systems change and it's enabled because those things are powered uh, by the cloud and po powered by a level of connectivity because you can actually change that device over time. So what do I mean by this? Well, an example um, is one of our customers, Sonos, is a great example. Anybody use a Sonos speaker at home or know what Sonos is? So Sonos is a Wi-Fi connected home audio system. They've been around for about a decade. I've personally uh, been a customer of Sonos's since they were in beta over a decade ago, not to age myself unnecessarily, but um, it's a great product. What's interesting is that the Sonos Cube that I bought 10 years ago still runs in my house with exactly the same functionality as a Sonos product that you could buy uh, off the shelf tomorrow. And the reason for that is that because they built smart, uh, they really thought through how they provided connectivity to these devices and over time, you know, once upon a time, you could only play the music that was on your hard drive or your PC. And then you could play streaming uh, audio off the internet. Then you could play Pandora, and then you could play Spotify, and then you could play Amazon Music, and so on and so forth. And then the speakers had the ability to do self-tuning in a room, and it, on and on and on. And all of this is enabled because that device is connected, and it's happened over time. You know, another example of this uh, in the automotive space would probably be Tesla. If you're lucky enough to own a Tesla, one day you bring it home, it's a great car, you go to bed, you wake up the next morning, it can go faster. You go to bed, you wake up the next morning, it can drive by itself. You go to bed, you get up in the morning, it can park itself. You go to bed, you get up the next morning, it can pull itself out of the garage on its own. Um, that is a, a great example of a system that gets better and better over time, and in, in particularly complex ways. But another important thing to note that we've, dis excuse me, that we've discovered about devices is that I think a lot of people when they build IoT systems confuse purpose with measurement. So what do I mean by that? Well, I took a show of hands. Everyone who's uh, ordered something from Amazon.com 
how did, how did something arrive at your house when you ordered it from Amazon.com? What happens? Yep, box shows up on your doorstep, right? Uh, so that's one purpose, and we have systems that track when your package arrives at your house. But in a number of cities, we have these things, these lockers. Same purpose. The purpose of this system, uh, and it is still a connected system, is to deliver you your package. Exactly the same purpose. Very different measurement, because now you're dealing with uh, it, which, which locker is it in? What's the code? Has it been picked up? Has the machine been vandalized? Is it a delivery or is it a return? So, uh, how long has it been there? Has the code expired? Uh, am I waiting for the right person? So on and so, you know, did the right object get into the right container? It's a very different purpose. Well, let's take that to the maximum logical extreme. What's the purpose of this device? One of our, you know, drones that get a bit of attention in the press. Well, the purpose is to deliver you your package. Exactly the same purpose. Very different measurement. Very different ways that you would control uh, this device over time. But your package arriving by drone or in a locker or by the United States Postal Service on a, on a weekend to your doorstep um, all have an element of common tracking uh, and common back end. So you have to really think through. So as you're deploying um, and thinking about IoT, really don't think about the way you maybe are doing things today. So if you combine these two points, once you connect a set of systems, they are going to change. And two, you're going to be able to innovate at a pace that the way you do things today certainly won't be the way you do them tomorrow. Another sort of critical point around IoT, and this comes up a lot in the consumer space, but more and more in the enterprise space as well, is that the customer has many identities. So again, let's hold this analogy of everyone here who ordered a package. When you order a package from Amazon.com, it has your name on the outside, it's delivered to your house. We were delivering it to you. Great, so you got your package. But uh, you're not the only one in your house maybe that buys stuff. You know, there might be two, three, four, five people in your house that have a uh, connection to your household. Uh, one of the big challenges in the IoT space has been this, how, in the consumer side, has been this concept of a household. How do you group uh, people together? Because whether it's music or video or delivery, there's usually a group of people uh, working off the same set of accounts. But it could actually apply in the enterprise as well, where you might have an individual person, a team of people, a person whose identity changes with their job function uh, at that particular moment. And so let's take this example of identity a step further as well. So in Germany, I was in Munich about two months ago. In Germany, interesting fact, uh, getting a package just delivered uh, on your doorstep actually doesn't really work uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, partially policy, uh, partially just sort of societal norms. People just don't, you just don't drop a package and run like they do here in the US. It kind of works here, right? Yes, occasionally some stuff goes wrong and we take care of that uh, for you, but for the most part, you know, drops on your, on your doorstep and you leave. Doesn't work in Germany. So you're left with two options. One, stay home. Uh, well, we all have to work. So that really may not be an option. There may be no one at home. Two, get it delivered to your work. Well, that may not be appropriate. You get the 42 inch or the 65 inch, uh, uh, you know, OLED TV delivered to the office. Might be inappropriate, might make the coworkers a little jealous or the Super Bowl parties at your place, uh, obviously. And then how are you going to get it home in the end? So we partner with DHL uh, in Germany and we do trunk delivery. And people would ask, like, why would you want to get a package delivered to your car? And that's why, is that DHL can show up, put the package in your car, it's ready to go, you didn't have to stay home, you didn't have to have it delivered to the office. So a couple of interesting points. You now have to connect your identity so yes, that's your package, but it's also your car, and you've given permission to that DHL driver to, uh, to use the app that unlocks the car as part of the delivery process. You get into very complex um, uh, 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 transferal of authority, um, which requires you really think through how you're building the authentication and identity systems that are built around uh, these Internet of Things applications. Uh, interesting point here on the delivery thing. DHL and Amazon love this uh, for one big reason about delivering to cars in car parks. Any, anybody guess what it is? So for efficiency, 
One, all the cars are in a straight line, and the DHL guy just drives in a straight line and dumps it into each car. And two, you save about a minute to two minutes a delivery by not having to walk up the, to the front uh, door of a house and over all the packages that gets delivered, that's hours and hours and hours of savings, that's a lot of money. So interesting uh, reasons for this. So there's a few sort of insights into what we've seen, both from what our customers are building, but also what our friends in Amazon.com tell us about some of the intricacies of building these uh, systems. And one thing sort of rings true is that there is this heavy lifting uh, that comes with uh, the Internet of Things. And here at AWS, we love this concept of heavy lifting. Our goal is to find the heavy lifting in technology, make it go away, turn it into services that you can consume, and focus on innovation and not on plumbing. That's kind of the goal here. And so the heavy lifting in IoT comes in a number of ways. So number one is devices. Devices come in every shape and size. Some devices are really advanced. They might be running an operating system, uh, Linux or a variation, or it might be a mobile device running Android or iOS, um, but it also might be the thermostat, which clearly isn't working in this room this morning, um, that simply sends out a stream of data of here's what the temperature is and whether I've been told to turn the temperature up or temperature down. And as a developer, trying to sort through all, like you talk about you know, fragmentation in the Android market and worrying about how to build for Android. The fragmentation in the IoT market makes the fragmentation in the Android market look like nothing. Devices, even at the, at the maker level, everybody's got a Raspberry Pi, but now everybody has their Arduino, but everybody has a Raspberry Pi 2. No, I got a Raspberry Pi 3. No, I got something from somebody else. These devices are becoming cheaper and easier to get every day. And for even for the hardened devices, your options are kind of endless. Network connectivity and protocols is another one you really have to think about. A modern device hopefully has Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or maybe a LTE radio or a 3G radio in it. It hopefully speaks HTTP, maybe hopefully HTTPS. And if, all the, if every device in the world spoke the same protocol, our lives as developers would be simple. Unfortunately, that's not the case. And so you have emerging protocols like MQTT, which has become very popular. But when you talk to a lot of our enterprise customers, hey, the reality is there's some protocol somebody wrote 25 years ago, uh, something coming off the CAN bus of a piece of heavy equipment um, that looks nothing like any of the protocols I've just mentioned. And so now we have to think about that as well. Security, end-to-end -end security is critical. We've seen, um, you know, certainly security is, is always sort of high priority, but you obviously don't want your Internet of Things systems, regardless of the type, uh, being hijacked in any way. And then data collection and smart. So data collection is important because that's kind of the goal here. The business value in, the, in IoT is around the data and what you do with it. So collecting that data and applying smarts to that data. You know, if we put a sensor out here on the door as everybody came in and it just blinked every time somebody walks through the door, you'd have a great stream of somebody's through the door, somebody's through the door, somebody's through the door, somebody's through the door. That actually isn't particularly useful. You actually have to be able to apply some filters and some rules and some smarts to that data to actually be able to do anything with it in the long term. And so, uh, last year at reInvent, uh, we announced the new AWS IoT service. And the goal of this service is to help take a big chunk of that heavy lifting uh, off the plates of our customers and w have it so it's a service that we take care of it, uh, allowing you to focus on innovations on the applications that you, excuse me, you build in the long run. And so very quickly, um, and I won't go into a super deep dive on the service, but I'll talk about a couple of things that are really important. So first it starts with devices. Uh, this uh, wind turbine here representing a device. Um, we have SDKs that run on devices. It's an open source SDK we make available to any hardware manufacturer, to all of you, you can take that SDK, uh, port it to your device of choice. Um, you should know we've made partnerships with almost all the major hardware manufacturers uh, we are very open to any chipset 
uh, any uh, operating system, uh, any architecture. We're not here really to try and king make any of those. We're really trying to give our customers the, the right tool, the best tool uh, for the job at hand. And so you'll see us support an incredibly wide uh, set of devices over time. Um, the first thing that the system does is it ingests messages from those devices. Uh, we've taken a publish subscribe, a pub sub approach um, to IoT. We believe it's a way that allows you uh, to have, back to that point of this being the Internet of Things, it allows for inter multiple systems to listen in on the same streams of data and use that data across multiple applications in the most efficient way possible. We introduced a new security model. Um, so many devices can't speak HTTPS, which is a traditional way of connecting uh, to AWS. We've introduced and said uh, certificate-based end-to-end security for devices. So now the device can authenticate knowing that it's AWS. AWS authenticates against the device knowing it's the device. Uh, it's full TLS certificate-based uh, security. Uh, we give infrastructure for device manufacturers to burn certificates at the time of manufacture to ensure that end-to-end -end chain is uh, preserved. We have a registry, keeps track of the devices. What is the device? Where is it? Who's allowed to use it? Um, but the first you know, real key part of this service is the gateway. And the gateway does a couple of things. It maintains communication with the device. It speaks multiple protocols, so it's able to translate whichever protocol um, that device uh, is speaking. We've started with MQTT and HTTP and WebSockets uh, now, um, and over time we will expand uh, that list to include others. Um, but that ge device gateway also serves a function of sort of being a front door to the rest of AWS, and we do that in two ways. One is the rules engine. The rules engine is a SQL-like environment that allows you to analyze the events and data coming from a device uh, at incredibly high speed. And why would you want to do that? Well, a device may send out multiple types of data. If we took the light bulbs in this room as an example, um, it might say, send I'm on, I'm off, or I'm broken. And for an on and off event, you may route that to an application uh, that powers maybe the mobile device that's controlling uh, the lights. But for the broken event, you may want to have that trigger a maintenance application or some other back-end system. And so the rules engine helps you look for those patterns in, of data and react to it. Uh, we route uh, the reactions to the rules to any number of AWS services. Most commonly, Lambda um, is the first stop for a lot of customers because of the event-driven nature of IoT matches the event-driven nature of Lambda, which is our serverless compute platform. So you write some code that says, if you see this event, do this. Lambda executes that code for you without having to worry about any server infrastructure. But that rules engine could route to uh, a database, and an application running on EC2, or anything exposed through an HTTP endpoint um, in your existing infrastructure. The device shadows the other side of the equation here. And this is where we unlock some benefits for uh, developers that are particularly unique. So what we do here, you know, I mentioned the light bulbs. So if you're a developer and you're building a companion application, and there's always a companion application, whether it's a consumer IoT project or an industrial IoT project, there's always a companion app. In the industrial side, it might be a monitoring app, it might be a control system. It might be a service application that a field service technician is using. There's always a companion app. The trouble is, when you write those companion apps, um, the, there's, there, you know, there are developers that are very familiar, have electrical engineering backgrounds who understand devices. And then there's developers who know how to write really great mobile apps. And you probably kind of want to hire the person who's really great at building a mobile app or a web app to build your mobile or web app. And so what the device shadow does is it takes the capability of a device and exposes those capabilities as APIs. So in the case of that light bulb, there would be an API for on, an API for off, and an API exposing the fact that there's a service event for that light bulb. And so now you can go and instead of hiring someone who has an electrical engineering background on light bulbs, you can hire an amazing iOS developer and say, build me the best companion app ever. Here are the APIs for interfacing with the device. That's all you need to know. 
Our customer, Rachio, who make uh, internet connected uh, sprinkler systems, it's like the nest for home lawn sprinklers, they switched to the IoT service and they told us the number one thing that saved them time and money more than anything else was the ability to hire developers who just focused on building apps and didn't have to think about all of the details of communicating with the device. So the device shadow along with the gateway handles on and off states. It handles a desired state of a device. It handles conflict between multiple messages asking a device to do something. It makes it much easier uh, for a developer over time. But I will say that the IoT service is only part of the full suite of what AWS has to offer uh, as you think about building a system uh, for the Internet of Things. We focused on the left hand of the chart here, which is really around the heavy lifting of connecting to devices, which is, for a lot of our customers, what they told us was the number one challenge that they were facing. But it's important to understand that as we think about analytics and machine learning and back uh, end applications, uh, mobile applications and edge services and storage, well, a lot of those names, and this isn't an exhaustive list, that's the rest of AWS, um, essentially. And so when people say, you know, what's your analytics story for the Internet of Things? Our analytics story is the AWS analytics story. What's your machine learning story? It's our machine learning story from AWS. And it's made possible because the IoT service is the front door for all those other applications uh, to interact with a device over time. A few of our strengths I've mentioned, a focus on security, a focus on serverless architectures, being the front door to the rest of AWS, um, operation on any chipset, any operating system, we're protocol agnostic, and most importantly, that cost follows usage. So in the IoT space, what we think is important is the same thing that we've done for the rest of the cloud, which is you only pay for what you use. And one of the things that makes us rather unique is we never ask you with our IoT service how many devices you want to connect and then sign you up for a service contract up front. It's all based on messages. So whether you have a million devices sending one message each or one device sending a million messages, that's irrelevant. It's about how many messages, it's the usage you place on the system, which is another sort of unique uh, element to our approach. So that's great. That helps take the heavy lifting uh, of the plumbing out of the hands of your developers so that they can focus on innovation. And where they're going to want to innovate is around solutions. And there's any number of solutions that they may want to build. Uh, I've mentioned many of them, public safety, waste management, energy and utilities, just as an example. And the way we achieve this is through our very robust partner ecosystem. So we have a set of partners who build on top of AWS IoT who then bring expertise in any number of horizontal and vertical solution areas. So an example is C3 IoT. Um, we just announced in the last week, uh, we, had, we did some press with them in the last week about their support of going uh, all in with AWS. Um, they build systems like uh, modules for predictive maintenance. So they use AWS IoT under the hood to connect to those devices, but they understand the asset classes, the, they have machine learning models. Um, so once you collect the data, they have preset modules for doing things like predictive maintenance, which is an incredibly popular solution because uh, there's a direct ROI of reducing uh, maintenance visits and truck rolls and whatnot uh, as you think about the maintenance of assets over time. They also do applications, for example, around smart grids. So they think about uh, distribution and transmission and generation. So they're building the backend systems, the dashboards, the interoperability layers, again, all on top of AWS and interfacing with our IoT service. Another great example is some work we did with Intel. This is an example of a demo they built around uh, congestion charge. Uh, so this was an automated system that ramped up and down uh, the congestion charge for traffic going in and out of a city core. It was done uh, with Intel in Europe. Um, again, using our AWS IoT system as a connection point for devices um, uh, as the backbone of the service. We have examples, another example from Intel, uh, first responder safety. So this is a wearable example, a hardened um, uh, uh, Android device collecting telemetry uh, from that first responder, uploading that telemetry and routing into a dashboard uh, for uh, first responder safety and monitoring over time. 
And then there's another potential, I think, for any of you who work um, and think about, so how can the trend of sort of consumer IoT help us in the public sector? I'll give you an example on this side. So I already mentioned Rachio. So they're, um, they're, they're a great, amazing customer for us. They've been with us since the beta of the service. They've switched. So if you go buy a Rachio sprinkler controller right now, it's all powered by AWS IoT uh, under the hood. I have one of these at home. And it's great because as a consumer, um, you know, it helps me save some money, it helps me make sure my plants look good, and make sure I don't use too much water. Well, what's interesting, I think, in the, in the public sector is to think, as this, you know, we, you know, if I go back one, this might be, in a way, the Internet of Thing. You know, it's just the control for my sprinkler. But what if you had an opportunity, and we sort of have this vision of, what if we were able to enable more of these vendors to connect ecosystems together? And I think there's an opportunity in the public sector in particular to be leaders around what if there were the, the weather monitoring and weather sensors that help feed uh, data, not just about maybe the weather, but regulations about water use, so watering bans and so forth. What if we partnered with the private sector and said, hey, can that data be exposed in the app? Could a consumer now opt in for a broader system of systems to say, hey, if there's a watering ban, Tell my controller there's a watering ban. I'm in. I want to be. A, I want to help. Um, but just like I don't control the sprinklers, the device does, and I could opt in. Maybe there'd be a benefit for me opting in to ensure, um, uh, you know, compliance to a watering ban and some benefit down the line. And so there is sort of this systems of systems element that I think can come into play. A lot of you might say, Hey, how do I get started with uh, IoT? And uh, we've done a few things. So I mentioned our partnerships with the hardware makers. Um, we have a number of starter kits that you can buy uh, from Intel and Qualcomm and, uh, and others. Uh, many of those starter kits are, built, are sold on Amazon.com if you're looking for them. But it's the typical kind of maker kit. If you have a Raspberry Pi at home or an Arduino at home, you want to start using our system, we do have a free tier. Um, that as an individual maker, you're probably never going to go over the free tier. So you can use the system essentially for free. Many of the other connecting services have free tiers as well. So if you're a maker, you want to just do or do something in the lab, you can probably build a, build a proof of concept without spending a penny on the services. But we went a step further. Um, if you've ever seen, Amazon created these buttons. Uh, these buttons were originally created for uh, replenishment. Uh, so we partnered with brands like Tide and you'd take this button, you'd stick it on your washer, and when you ran out of uh, detergent, you'd hit the button, and it would add that to your cart and order it based on uh, the profile that you set. But this is interesting hardware, right? It's relatively cheap. Um, it does two things, click and double click. And what we did was we built a special AWS version of this. You can buy it on Amazon.com. It's 20 bucks, and it's pre-wired to our service. So now you don't have to do anything other than buy this, log into your account, and when you click and you double click, you get two events. What can you do with two events? Kind of anything you want. Uh, so just think about what would you want enabled with a click of a button. Now you can write the Lambda functions and the backend systems, but it's a very, very easy way to get started. Uh, simple hardware, uh, and you know if you have teams that are thinking of sort of proof of concept kind of work in the lab, educational purposes. This is a great device. If you're, if you're a hacker and a maker yourself, lots of people have done cool things. Push a button, turn the lights on, push a button, start a phone call, push a button, send a text, call an Uber, uh, you name it. Um, you can, if you can think of something to do with a push button, you can enable it with this device. So this is a great, easy way uh, to get in the door. We also have enterprises thinking about using this, even in production, thinking about applications that this could apply to. The other interesting trend, um, what's been fun about IoT at AWS is, as you've seen in my presentation, I think typically AWS people wouldn't talk so much about what the rest of Amazon is doing. I do always like to reinforce. What you do on AWS is nobody's business but your own. That's why people like it. Uh, we're making services available to you. They're yours. You use them. It's great. R has nothing to do with the rest of Amazon.com other than the learning and best practices and guidance that we provide, which is great. But more and more in IoT, there are things going on in the rest of the company that we kind of want to let you know about because it's interesting, a lot of developers have told us they find it fascinating. And probably at the top of the list is Alexa. And the fact that we do believe that voice, 
is a powerful new user experience that will become really prevalent in devices over time. And so we believe voice will be everywhere, at home, in the car, um, eventually even at work. Um, and has anybody seen the Echo, uh, this device? Ever seen this device? So the Echo, just to be uh, clear on naming here, the Echo is a device built by Amazon it has, a, it has a, a, a great speaker in the bottom, a set of far field microphones in the top. You buy it, it's, it's about this big, you put it on the shelf at home, you use it to play back music. But most importantly is it's powered by Alexa, which is a cloud service that enables all of the voice recognition and all of the applications, and what we call skills in the background that allow Alexa to do interesting things. We've actually gone so far as to take that cloud service and bring it to our Fire devices as well. So if you have a Fire TV or a Fire Stick, Alexa is now on your Fire TV as well. That's an interesting point because what we're gonna do over time is there's really two types of Alexa that you need to know about. On the one side are skills. So if you've ever used Alexa and you say, Alexa, what's the weather today? And she answers with the weather, it's gonna be really hot in Washington today. Or if you say, Alexa, turn the lights off in the living room, those are skills. Those are ascent, think of them as voice apps that make Alexa do more things. Anyone can build a skill. And so um, if you have, say, for example, data you know, that you want um, residents to have access to, um, sort of 311 ish city directory kind of information, other kind of general FAQs. You can build a skill and have Alexa, hey Alexa, ask whatever department a question and have that information uh, provided back. You can take it a step farther. Essentially, Alexa can do anything. Typically what happens is any API you have available, say for a mobile app or a web app, can be made available to Alexa as well. And building voice applications is very straightforward. But the other type of Alexa is what we call the Alexa voice service. And this is the ability to take Alexa and put it into other devices. So to go back to what I said earlier, Echo is a device powered by the Alexa voice service. Fire TV is now powered by the Alexa voice service. Any third party device can be powered by the Alexa voice service. So what you will see over time are refrigerators and TVs and other things that all have Alexa built into them. And so if that is of interest, you can actually take the Alexa voice service and deploy it uh, onto devices of your own. Um, today, heavy consumer focus, so any sort of, con any sort of consumer facing, you know, uh, resident facing kind of application um, uh, or device, like a kiosk as an example, could be powered by AVS. And so we do think voice is a very important uh, advancement going forward. The other is around sort of education and exploration. And so, you know, we, uh, through our public sector organization, uh, I mentioned the buttons, but we have starter kits. We have the ability to help build workshops and curriculum um, at varying levels, uh, you know, from, um, uh, for, you know, young, you know, this would be great for curriculum for younger uh, kids up to more advanced um, sort of college and university level curriculum as well. It's great for, we do a lot of workshops for customers on uh, their own staff, um, getting labs up and running around IoT, helping train staff on how to build these systems over time. So we do have this sort of major education uh, component to how we think about uh, how we help in the Internet of Things uh, as well. And with that, um, I would strongly encourage all of you uh, to go visit some of the other sessions today around IoT. I suspect that in Andy's keynote, I bet the word comes up once or twice in Andy's keynote. It's kind of a popular thing right now. Um, members of my team, uh, Katie's here, Shree's here from the public sector team, uh, the rest of the AWS crew, we're always happy to answer questions. Um, I'll hang out here for a few minutes uh, and, and I'll take some questions uh, from the, we have a couple of minutes at the end, but I'll also hang out here and out in the hall for a second. I really appreciate you spending uh, 45 minutes with us this morning. We really hope you enjoy the rest of the summit today and let us know how we can help. Thank you very much. While people are filtering out, any questions I can, anybody got a question I can answer from up here? Otherwise, feel free if it's like a super quiet question. Sir. 
So the shadow is the part of the AWS IoT service that essentially takes, creates a cloud copy of the capabilities of a device and makes it available for developers. So any device, basically the expected behavior of a device, on, off, moving, not moving, whatever the events are, and we describe that in the shadow, expose it as RESTful APIs, and then anyone wanting to build an application simply calls those APIs. They don't need to know anything about the device under the hood. That's what the shadow does. Sir? I'm just curious, like, how does the increasing acceleration work? Well, if you drive a really big van, <laughs> they would deliver. Uh, no, there's a set of things that they'll deliver. Uh, typically, people stay home, uh, honestly. Um, I don't know. I've never seen anybody. The one nice thing about working at Amazon is they're very open to packages getting delivered to the office. Uh, so we're maybe uh, the wrong focus group for that. But uh, you know, TVs typically you know, include installation. But a lot of other pack people just don't want to have a ton of packages. So, Sir. Uh, yes, uh, we probably need an hour. Um, so self-driving cars, uh, I think it depends. So there's, there's uh, assisted driving, there's autonomous driving, um, semi and fully autonomous driving. Um, uh, our work comes in a, in a few ways in the auto space. So one, as uh, uh, we have a number of customers who are building the machine learning models and need, uh, essentially they use the cloud for the massive computational uh, needs. Um, we have people that are even doing things like, have you seen the Snowball device uh, from uh, AWS, which is our um, uh, storage appliance? So this is an appliance we usually ship to customers. You load it up with data and you ship it back to us and we load it into the cloud for you for chart. Well, we even have people who are taking Snowballs and putting them in the back of cars and collecting data and dumping it onto the snowball and then shipping us the snowball and doing the machine learning after the fact so they don't have to you know, send like terabytes of data over an LTE modem, as an example. So it, building the machine learning um, is probably the biggest one. A lot of work, we did a number of announcements around Alexa with the automakers, uh, which isn't necessarily an autonomous driving effort, but it's certainly a big part of what we do uh, with the automakers in the back end, uh, powering a lot of the mobile services as well. So we run the gamut for sure.